Hello, everyone. Welcome to Neurosurgery Week, finally. <laughs> okay, so I am going to start with part one of neurosurgery so we can go ahead and get through a little bit of an anatomy review and go over some instrumentation. So let me just share my screen with you guys so you can look at my neurosurgery slide. There we go. Okay, so yes, you should know this anatomy, but of course, I put a little bit of a review on here for you. So it actually goes right into instrumentation. So I will start and follow along with your book as usual. So we're gonna dive right into instrumentation. Um, I'm actually not going to go through your orange book. This is because I want you to know every instrument that's in there. So yes, I could go through the orange book and read it to you, but I'm gonna point out specific things about the instruments as we go through our lecture. So what I'm telling you is you need to know every instrument in that orange book under neurosurgery. Um, this is our last chapter, so I do think it'd be a good idea for you after you go through these neurosurgical instruments to see what other instruments are in there that you have forgotten. So flip back through and give yourself a review of your instrumentation. But as you know, neurosurgery is my favorite and it is because We've got big instruments like orthopedics, but we also have really tiny instruments for microsurgery. So that brings me to my instrumentation picture. So I put this picture down for your basics for a reason. So you need to know all your basics in your book for spine and crany. But on this Mayo stand here, you'll see a few instruments that are both. Like this looks like a spine setup to me, definitely. But a lot of the instruments are used for both neurosurgery and for, um, sorry, both for uh, spine and cranies for neurosurgery. So I want to go through a couple here. Just by glancing, I can tell what these are. So these two right here are two different rongeurs. I can tell by the handles. We're going to have lots of rongeurs to bite big pieces of bone during both types of neurosurgery cases. Right here, I've got two different, it looks like nerve hooks, especially this big one. They're going to use these nerve hooks for a lot of different things. It's not always to hook around a nerve. So I just wanted to point that out. It's used for other things. Looking at this instrument right here, I hope that this is familiar to you. If not, I will point it out because it's not in neurosurgery in your orange book. So I believe we learned this in ENT, but that one is called a Woodson. So a Woodson elevator, sometimes people call it, but it is a Woodson. Um, it's a stick handheld instrument, so kind of similar to all of your pen fields that you will see on page 1,131. So similar, but has multiple functions. So with this Woodson elevator, you'll read in your book about things called a dural elevator. This can be used for exactly that. It can be used as a dural separator or elevator. Um, after that, I'm going to skip over to this instrument right here. Hopefully you see that little piece on the end. That is some bone wax. So this looks like uh, from the Roton set. So it's very small for microsurgery, but there's a little piece of bone wax on it. That's because as soon as they get in there, even in microsurgery, some of that bone will still be bleeding and that's how they're going to apply the bone wax to the bone. So they're gonna put it on the end of an instrument and then rub it onto that bone to stop the oozing, the bleeding. After that, I'm going to stop at this Cobb elevator. You should 100% know what a Cobb elevator is before you go into a spine case. That is one of the main instruments they are going to be using. It is an elevator, so they will use it as a Cobb elevator to scrape the periosteum. They can also kind of use it as retraction in spine. Uh, whenever I assisted in spine, that's what I did for hours was hold a Cobb very steadily so that the surgeon could see. So it kind of holds back some soft tissue that maybe the Wheatlander, Adson, Beckman retractors aren't holding back. Sometimes it's also just as they're working. So they'll do a little bit of work and then you get the cop elevator and elevate some more. You just kind of go with the flow on that one. After that, you can see that there are some curettes and other small elevators over here, but you need to learn all of your bone instruments uh, spine and for crany. Uh, what was good for me learning neuro instruments is a lot of them go hand in hand. So I learned spine first and when I started doing cranies I already knew most of the instrumentation because the same or very similar. 
So before I get into your book, so I put this picture right here for a reason of this section. So this was a bad day for me. I, uh, <laughs> and if I've already told you this story, I apologize. But my surgeons like to use irrigation onto the brain during cranies like this. And this is extremely common. That's not something odd for a surgeon to do in neurosurgery. So <laughs> we had the big syringe with irrigation and I would drip onto the brain with that irrigation while he was working. Uh, this was perfect, you know, small drips from that small Fraser tip attached to that syringe. So good way of doing it. This is the way we had done it for years. Well, we always check the lumens of our suction tips as we should, uh, but that doesn't always happen, right? You're setting up, you're in a hurry, or sometimes you might look and check the lumen and it looks like it's good, but then you do the case and this happens. So this happened to me, I just felt some resistance. It was almost as if I just knew something was wrong. So I went to hand it over, I felt some resistance when I was pulling it up, like drawing up the liquid into the syringe. But why is there resistance? And I took it, turned around from the Mayo stand to the back table and I was pushing and pushing and it wouldn't push through the suction tip. So I finally pulled back on the plunger again after pushing really hard back on the plunger. Well, when I pulled back, it was like a vacuum and it sucked this blood clot out of that suction tip. So that means we were going to use that suction tip on a new surgery and a sterile case. We were going to irrigate that onto somebody's brain. I mean, so the question of course went down the line of blaming SPD, blaming me because I'm the script tech and I should have noticed that. And, you know, going down the line, see who sterilized the instruments and all of those things. That's why you need to know that mistakes happen. So that's your job to look for it. So now when it got down to it at the end of the day, did I get in a lot of trouble? No, the SPD personnel did. I got myself in a lot of trouble. I knew that I was never going to let something like that happen again. So I checked my suctions even more closely. I might use that stylet that comes with the suction to scrape through the center and make sure it's actually been cleaned properly before handing it over. So these mistakes can happen in, anywhere. So if you're working at an OR and you think, man, our SPD is just fantastic. I've never seen a dirty instrument. Do not get complacent. Mistakes happen. It's your job to catch other people's mistakes. And the biggest thing is taking responsibility. So like I said, even though I didn't get in a whole lot of trouble for that and get written up or anything like that, I hold myself accountable. I knew that I wasn't going to let something like this ever happen again. So I didn't really need somebody to say, hey, do a better job checking your instrumentation. No, I know that that's what I should be doing. That's my responsibility. So take responsibility if you have something like this come up, because no, was that your fault? No, but you should have checked it. So that's my story to check your suction tips. Make sure they have actually been cleaned properly. Look inside those lumens. Okay, instrument basics right there. So I'll look at page 1130. So yes, you should know all the instruments on this page. Um, it starts by showing you that Hudson, uh, sorry, Hudson drill, I almost said retractor. So your Hudson brace is what they call it, and it comes with lots of different bits. So this is what we call a hand drill or a crank drill more commonly. So I would definitely write that note down that this is called a crank or a handheld drill. Uh, you need to know that because if they just ask you for a drill and you're, you know, you're scrubbed in, you're used to scrub tech things, you're gonna be thinking electric or pneumatic drill, right? This is more old school, it's a handheld crank. Now, do we still use this? Yes. There are situations like patients in the ICU, we can't run up to the OR, get the piece of equipment and the handpiece to, to drill in the ICU. We don't have time for that. This is emergent. We need to get into the head as quickly as possible. That's what this Hudson brace is used for. And we can do a handheld crank drill, crank into the brain, to relieve pressure or whatever the emergency is. That's usually what it is, uh, relieving intracranial pressure, the ICP. So definitely be familiar with your handheld crank drill. Don't think it's old school, we don't use it anymore. We still use that. Uh, this is typically a disposable handpiece. So that you'll open this out of a sterile package, you'll use it once and you throw it away. It's not something that's sterilized and reused all the time. 
Now, if you get one out of an instrument tray, that is more old school and that will be re-sterilized and reused. So after that, it gives you some more options uh, for drilling. And I got a whole slide on drills. So I'll stop at giggly saw. So some surgeons actually choose to use the giggly saw, which is a little crazy to me to use on the head on purpose. But for me, I've seen it when our drill was stuck. So we go to use the drill, it gets stuck, battery stops, stop working. What do we do? We need to get the skull off as quickly as possible. Give me the giggly saw. So they can thread that blade through, put the handle on each end, and boom, the bone is cut. Just like that, super fast. So giggly saw, just like the one we use to amputate legs, that's the same thing we can use to get the bone flop off if we have to, but we've got lots of better options. So after that, you'll see there's various bone rongers. So you should be familiar with all the different kinds of rongers. As you're reading, I want you to focus on, there are handheld rongers like Kerasons, it looks like a little gun pistol grip. And then there are big rongers that you'll have to hold like this, like the Lexel or the Adson. These are to take big pieces of bone out, usually in spine cases. Kerasins used on spine and on craniotomies. So they all go hand in hand, but I want you to be familiar with all your different types of rongers. So I focused on Kerasin, the handheld ones. You'll see in figure 24-3. And then you're bigger like the Adsen and, sorry, Adsen Ronger and other different big ron handheld rongers. Those will be more in your orange book. So you can look at those in there. After that, I want to point out what I told you in ENT surgery. So it starts talking about pituitary rongers. So you know, pituitary ronger in ENT is called a Takahashi forceps. Remember, it's the same instrument, it just has a different name. So your pituitary rongers are still rongers. They are going to be able to big, take big grasps and bites, but pituitary rongers are usually used for softer tissue. So in cranies, they can be used to take out tumor. Um, in the endonasal cases, they're used to take out tumor. In spine, they're used to take out pieces of disc because it's softer. And that disc, it, to me, looks like little pieces of crab meat. It's very soft and fragile compared to these big pieces of bone. So if you know your surgeon is taking big pieces of bone and they ask for a ronger and they're not specific, you should think a handheld ronger or a kerosene. If they're taking out pieces of disc and they say ronger and they're not specific, you should think pituitary ronger so they can take out that piece of disc or soft tissue. So things like that will help you anticipate in neurosurgery. So even if the surgeon doesn't use all their words, all their adjectives, you can use your brain and anticipate what they're going to need. So even if they don't use the right term, you already know what they need. Okay, so after the rongers, multiple different kinds, we'll stop at pen filled dissectors. So you see some of these on this mayo stand right here, but I want you to look at page 1131 in your book. So all your pen field dissectors. The most common instrument I used on a craniotomy was the pen field number one. So after they drilled in and got where they wanted to be, anything on bone work, he used a pen field number one. Uh, now actually applying the bone wax, they might use a pen field number two. So I want you to see that there's two ends of these pen fields. So the pen field number one, the end my surgeon usually used was the circle end, that little circle could be used to scrape out bone like a curette. It could be used to scrape out tumor. It's got so many uses. But the other end, the nice flat spatula end, can be used to apply bone wax to bone. So all these different numbers are actually very similar. But for you, so you can tell the difference, I want to point it out for you. So number one, pen filled one has that cup. Pen filled two and three look very similar, right? So pen filled two is more straight. Pen field three is like a C on the end. So it's like a scoop almost. So we would use this sometimes to pick up scoops of hemostatic agents, one of them's called avatine, and sprinkle it onto the dura. So lots of different uses for these instruments. So you really need to know the names of them. Pen fields are easy. They're numbered one through four. So, well, technically five, but nobody uses the five. 
you need to know one through four Penfield and be familiar with them. The easiest one is number one, it's got the cup, and number three, it's got that C shape on the end. That brings me to Penfield number four. So right here in your picture, I said this is a Roten 6, right? I know that just by looking at it. That's a smaller version of a Penfield 4. So Penfield 4 is skinny and finer, and you usually see this instead of a Freer elevator in your tray. Now that's what I have seen. I don't want you to be surprised if there's a Freer elevator in there too to throw you off your instrument game, but uh, they typically use the Penfield 4 instead. So this is another good one to put bone wax on the end to apply that to bone when it's bleeding in the surgery. Okay, so after that, let's look at retractors because that's what's in your book. So Wheatlaner, Atzen Bexman, Atzen Cerebellar, you should remember all of those retractors. So spine retractors you should be okay with, but again, you should know every instrument in that orange book. I will stop at the brain retractors. So there's a picture after you keep going in the book, but I want you to know Layla and the Greenberg brain retractors. I'm smiling because I worked with a surgeon who never used brain retractors, which is almost unheard of. So some of your supplies can actually be used for retraction, and we'll get into that when we get to supplies. So now that you've learned two new brain retractors, which are really fun to put together, by the way, uh, look at your manual retractors. You should definitely be familiar with the Myrodine and the Cushing retractor. So that Cushing retractor I always had on my Mayo stand for craniotomies because we would use that to retract the muscle back as they are still drilling and taking that bone flap off. After that, you'll see other options for brain retractors. So notice that it says malleable brain spoons. So if your set or your facility does not have malleable brain spoons, they're just gonna throw malleable ribbons in there and that is fine. So it's the same idea, they're just smaller. So malleable retractor can yes, be placed on the brain because all the blades that go with those self-retaining retractors, the Layla and the Greenberg, they're the same. They're little malleable ribbons. They're just attached to a device to give more traction and to pull on it. So everybody's thought of way of thinking is a little bit different on this one. The surgeon I worked with did multiple studies that showed that there's brain damage happening when retractors are pushed on the brain tissue too much. Other surgeons found different ways to pad the brain, which I'll go over, but some surgeons have just found different techniques and have taken the retractors out altogether, like the one I worked with. So lots of different options there. Uh, as we keep going, I've gone through most of these instruments so far. So let's look at section tips. So it says Fraser or Atson. You need to have lots of Fraser section tips in different sizes. So I want you to think of this like ear surgery. Even though the lumens aren't quite as tiny, you need to have lots of different sizes available because we're doing microsurgery when it really comes down to taking the tumor out usually. So you're gonna wanna have lots of different sizes and think about the first thing we're doing. We are drilling and then sucking up all that bone and irrigation that's happening during that time. So that section is gonna get clogged very quickly. So you need to always have more sections available because I'm not gonna let my surgeon wait on suction because typically in surgery, they'll say, oh, my section's clogged. They'll hand it to you. You need to deal with it within 30 seconds. So that started with me taking the Fraser tip off. I felt my tubing to feel if there was any suction coming. If not, I know the tubing is clogged. I need new tubing. But if it is, I feel suction on the end of that tubing then I can just put my Fraser section in here and get the bone out of it, flip it around, give it a drink, let it take some saline in there and clean out the suction tubing line and that Fraser section, and then hand it right back over. Is that quick and efficient? Yes. What's better is let me deal with unclogging the suction with the stylet and already have another section ready to go. So when my surgeon says, my suction is clogged, Michelle, I don't even respond. I pop that suction tip off, throw it on the back table, grab a clean one, pop it on. Here you go. New suction for you. While they're working, I can get another suction. I can use the stylet. I can use anything to clear out that suction tubing. So suction is very important in neurosurgery and you need to be prepared for the fact that it's going to get clogged and have 
plan B, C, and D ready to go for your suction. Okay, as we keep going, periol steel elevators. Let me move my face over here a little bit. Periol steel elevators. So there's one right here actually, but you know what elevators look like. So there's lots of different kinds, but if it looks something similar to a rear elevator or a key elevator, then it's still an elevator. It's going to be used to elevate bone or periosteum. Um, after that, it looks at aneurysm clips, and I'll talk about that when we get to aneurysms. What you need to add to that is what's in your orange book. So there are temporary and permanent clips, and there's a different handle, excuse me, a plier for both of those. I will tell you as far as when it comes to loading these, it's kind of like heart surgery, like those Castro Viejo needle drivers. They've got a little attachment in the center, so you have to pick it up and clamp that aneurysm clip on there just right so it clicks in the middle when you hand it over there. So it's hard to explain <laughs> through video without holding it in your hands, but the name of the game is definitely finesse and being very gentle and calm. So even if you see lots of bleeding happening on the microscope screen and the surgeon is yelling, give me that clip, you need to calmly and steady load that clip because I promise you the calmer you are, the faster it'll be for you to load it and hand it over. Uh, after aneurysm clips, hemoclips, yes, you'll need lots of hemoclips, just like vascular surgery. And then after that, bipolar forceps. So we're gonna use lots of bipolar in spine and cranies um, instead of bovi. Now that means intra-op, like in the middle, getting bleeders. Still, when you're getting in after your incision, you're gonna use bovi to dissect down. They still might use monopolar bovi to get some of the bleeders, but bipolar is just much more convenient uh, for where we're working at. Okay, that's my basic instrumentation, and that brings me into drills. So you'll see on the next two pages, there's lots of instrumentation. You need to know all of those. I just kind of did a little separation so you guys can get some more details about these instruments. So here's all the different kinds of drills you're going to be using. Typically, Midas Rex drill. So this is the handpiece. You see how this is very long on the end? That's gonna be used for spine surgery. Do you see how this one's very short? For craniotomies. So kind of like your same thinking that you have in general surgery, I need longer instruments when I get deeper in the belly. Same thing here. When we get deep into the spine, we're gonna need longer instruments to get down there to be able to see. Okay, so drill bits. So you see all these different options, right? So many different options, so many different drill bits. Let's do the basics, what they typically use. So you see this burr hole right here. This is what they're going to start with. So yes, you know the hand crank drill I just told you about. It's gonna make the same circle. In surgery, not using the hand crank drill, regular planned surgery. Uh, it's going to be your surgeon's preference, but there's one of two options to start this, this burr hole. So what I'm used to is this handheld electric drill. We make a burr hole, we make another one, then we flip to the side cutter to connect the dots, and then take the bone flap off. Another option is this perforator, what they call it right here. So this is actually more old school. This is what we use to perforate the bone but it's the same idea. You're drilling a nice circle so that we have somewhere to get started to put our drill in so we can drill all the way around. So step one with drilling is either a perforator to get into the cranium or this handheld electric drill to get into the cranium. At that point, you have this, this pretty burr hole, got a nice circle. So what we're looking at is dura. So the next drill thing they want is something to protect the dura. So your drill is gonna have a dural guard and it says this in your book when it talks about craniotomies. So look for that. This says dural guard. So the drill bit of course will be inserted in there with the same handpiece. And now we can lock it on right here. Now it's got that nice piece of metal protecting the dura. So they can drill all the way around without ripping the dura because sometimes your dura likes to stick to the bone. So when they go to start drilling, it could start ripping it. You don't wanna rip the dura. We wanna very nicely and precisely cut it just right so that we can sew it back together properly. So you don't wanna rip the dura. So step one, we're gonna make a burr hole. Step two, I wrote out for you. 
you're going to use the dural guard to drill all the way around and take that bone flap off. So that is drills. I know I focused on craniotomy there a lot, but the longer ones are going to be used for spine. This is what your Midas Rex box looks like, so what it's going to be plugged into. And as you can see, there's different attachments. So if your surgeon wants irrigation and suction attached to their drill, we can do that. There's lots of different options. This is just one. Okay, after that, I went into the different implants you're gonna see, which is just my favorite. So you guys know I have a skull in my office, so I've had lots of practice with this cranial fixation tray. This is just one, this is Lorenz. So you can see that it comes with lots of different options for plates right here, and then not a whole lot of options for screws because they don't need a lot of options. They typically do four millimeter screw throughout uh, because it's the same thickness of bone, same kind of bone throughout. So there are big mesh pieces for if there's a hole that we don't plan on filling in with an implant, maybe that's how they want to fix that. They have big mesh pieces for that. They have scissors so that you can cut it. Lots of different options for you, but I will say anything plates and screws, we're going back to orthopedics. So even though we won't be measuring for these screws, it'll just be plate, screw, plate, screw. They should never have to wait on that. If they're plating, you should already know, load another screw, have it ready. Uh, all of the numbers are on here. So this is a good example of when I did not have a rep in the room. Uh, the reps knew I did not need them or their help on craniotomies because I would actually get to plate the bone myself a lot after I had a few years of experience. The surgeon knew that that would save us a lot of time because I knew how to plate the bone. So I would put the bone flap on the back table before they started closing up, I would already be plating the bone. So then when it comes time to close, instead of just handing them a bone flap, I handed them a bone flap with the plates already attached. So all they had to do was maybe add one or two more screws to attach it to the skull. But implants, you're just gonna have a lot, so make sure you are communicating with your rep, especially on spine. I love the spine implants because of the colors. <laughs> I know that sounds silly, but it just comes in all these crazy, beautiful colors. So if you want to get on Medtronic, Synthes, Depew, anybody's website and look at their spine uh, instrumentation, it's just beautiful, especially the posterior spine. Uh, this one right here, this fuchsia, beautiful color screw, I never got to use very often. So I would always look at all these different beautiful colors. A lot of patients are the same size, so we might use you know, emerald green 10 times in a row, and then one case I ever did got to use that aquamarine blue. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting to be looking at something for years and years and never get to use it except for on that one patient. So stuff like that I remember, like finally getting to use the aquamarine screws instead of these fuchsia ones. So lots of different things for you to learn um, and to distract you if you're me with all the colors. <laughs> so there's your implants and instrumentation for both spine and craniotomy. So after that, I go into equipment. So I'm gonna have to look back at my book for just a second, so don't skip to that. Page 1,133. So this is what I was telling you about your aneurysm clips. So still finish out your instrumentation. I just don't have anything else to add to that. So read about your differences on aneurysm clips. And then everything else I believe I went through on that page. So you can see your microsurgical instruments for actually taking the tumor out. And then the rainy clips I am definitely going to talk about. So now we're caught up, now we can go to equipment. So I separated equipment for spine and for crany. So let's actually look at your book first. So routine equipment, Gardner Wells or Mayfield pin fixation device. You need to know both of those terms. Now the Mayfield can be used in pins as you see here, or it can be used on a horseshoe headrest. And I will show both of those for you so you can see the difference. And after that, the next bullet point, it talks about what we use for spine, which I will also show you. So we're going to use the Wilson frame. Now you can also use the Andrews table as it says, but what's more common is the Jackson table. So I'm going to show you that too. Okay, so right here you can see you'll need a microscope and the head and pins typically for craniotomy. I sp put the specifics for you because I know it and I don't want you to have the same confusion I did. 
So craniotomy for tumor or aneurysm needs this pen fixation. They can also do this same pen fixation for some spine cases. On top of that, when there's a big subdural hematoma like the video I posted today, we could be removing such a large piece of skull that we can't have the head in fixation. We can't have it in pens. So their head is just going to lay on that horseshoe. So it's still part of the Mayfield, just the horseshoe instead. These are what these pens look like that are going to be put into the skull. And yes, they go directly into the skull. Typically they will inject lidocaine into the three spots where the pens are gonna go. Uh, someone will hold the head and then the neurosurgeon typically pens. So uh, a lot of the times I was holding the head. So I would hold the head and then the surgeon would place the pens under the skull very quickly. So yes, blood would rush out of those pen sites on some patients. We would put some bacitracin on the tips of these pens, which is uncommon um, to try to help with infection because you think about it, you're putting it sometimes through the patient's hair. Um, of course, we want it to be clean because they're having surgery, but we have no way of guaranteeing, guaranteeing that. So just as an extra precaution, we put some bacitracin on these pins before putting them into the skull, but we definitely inject with lidocaine before pinning the patient. I have seen this awake and asleep. We do lots of awake craniotomies now. So unfortunately, this does have to be done awake sometimes. When that's the case, they're gonna take a long time injecting local anesthetic to really make sure that area is numbed up before they pin the skull, because that is very painful for your patient. So that is one of the times where I would maybe hear a patient kind of yelp when we first put them in pins if they were awake. So even with all the local anesthetic in the world, you probably feel that pushing into your skull bone. Okay, so that's your Mayfield with pins and your microscope. Uh, looking at the microscope, I want to point out something for you. Our surgeon's face is touching this drape, right? This sterile drape. So throughout the case, after you see where their face touches, you have to constantly be vigilant and make sure they don't reach up and touch that. Because if those eye pieces are off a little bit, that's going to be their thing they're going to go for is just reach up and fix it themselves. Don't let them. You do not put your hands up there. Your face has been on that. Let me fix it for you. I have put a third pair of gloves on before, adjusted it for the surgeon, and then taken that extra pair of gloves off. There's things like that that you can do, but you just have to be vigilant and watch those surgeons. Make sure they don't contaminate and not realize it. Okay, equipment for spine. So as I said, this is a Jackson table. So I posted some YouTube videos. You should definitely look over how to use the Jackson table, and then for extra, if you want to, this Mizuho table. So this is what I always called rotisserie chicken. Uh, that means we can do anterior and posterior spine. So we could, uh, like this patient, do posterior, then put the back of the bed on their back, and then get ready to safely flip the patient like a rotisserie chicken. So now we can do their anterior uh, surgery. So we can do what's called a 360 back. We can do both sides um, with this Mizuho table. Uh, what they're actually laying on is the Wilson frame, which you should definitely know. Uh, comes with disposable covers, so we're not all laying on that same pad. And then look at the face rest. Anesthesia typically gets this, but you need to know where it is for spine cases. So their face is going to lay in this face rest and it's got a hole so that their ET tube can come out safely and they can um, have their general anesthesia during the case. So prone, face rest, and disposable pillow. Then look at your C-arm and C-arm drape. So you know you'll need a drape to go with your C-arm. And you need to make sure your bed is ready for the C-arm to come underneath and not contaminate anything. And then lastly, I put your microscope is also used on some spinal cases. So more rare, but there's certain even anterior, like at ACDF, we always use a microscope. Posterior spine, we don't typically use a microscope. If there is a spinal cord tumor, I hate to say I love spinal cord tumors, but oh my goodness, they are so cool. Looks like a little spider web almost because of their attachment to the spinal cord. One of the coolest things to see, have to have a microscope. So little things like that, you gotta pay attention to the details. So I hope as you're reading through 
some of these surgeries, you're paying attention to details like that because a lot of it is anticipation. So you're gonna learn everything you need for spine. Like for instance, you just learned all the equipment. So if you were setting up for a spine case right now, you may not think of microscope, but hopefully that'll be in the back of your head. So if you hear somebody say, oh, well, we're taking out a tumor, you could go, oh, so I need the microscope too. And you can go get that and bring that into the room. So a lot of equipment you need for neurosurgery. So you really have to read the preference card and learn what equipment you need for each specific surgery. Ah. Okay, so more spine equipment. So you can see how many implants you're gonna have on the back table. This is just some of the trays. There were many cases I did that we had a whole nother table, like besides this, full of trays, or we would just start stacking and stacking and stacking um, until you get it. But that just means you're gonna have to have extra back tables and more time to set up. Typically, stuff like this is a lot like orthopedics. As you're setting up, you should be working with your sales rep, and they're teaching you how to handle this stuff in what order, and they're kind of anticipating themselves. They are thinking, okay, we think we're going to use this plate and this screw. Why don't you go ahead and get it out? So then in the middle of the case, there's less stuff to get out, and less time you have to take your eyes away from the surgical field and to this back table looking at all of these implants because that's the idea right you want to be as ready as possible so you don't have to look away from the surgical site and grab more implants off of that back table but there's so many moving pieces with these you will have to turn away sometimes to get what you need and communicate with your rep but extra back tables extra back table covers to go with it and then right here I added navigation because this is an extra piece of equipment. So one that you can look up is Medtronic, but there's lots of different brands. Stryker is another one. They allow you to navigate. So it's like they're looking at a live CT scan or MRI as they are making their moves in the middle of surgery. So that means looking at this picture right here, the surgeon might have a certain trajectory as they're going in. And then the screen, their imaging is telling them, Mm, you're a little bit off. Maybe you're a little lateral. Bring it in immediately. So it's crazy how precise we can get these now due to navigation. So navigation can be used for craniotomies also, but I've got another picture for that. You know, wanted you to see that you can use navigation for spine now also. Uh, lastly, I added the bone mill just because I always really enjoyed it. Some of these spine cases, you'll get so much bone that they are going to want you to chop up that bone in the bone mill and then use it as a graft to give back to that patient. So sometimes there will be a cage like for anterior spine and you're gonna fill up that cage with bone graft, the patient's own bone, cause why not? We just did that laminectomy and give me all of that spinous process and that lamina, we will chop it up, give it right back to the patient. So this is a bone mill. Yes, it's just a blender basically. So you put the bone in the top there hold the plunger down and just drill up your bone. Uh, there's some surgeons that like to mix this with bone putty, bone matrix, things like that, anything to promote bone growth within the spine. So lots of different cool tools and equipment. And here is your Mayfield horseshoe. So as I said, you can use the Mayfield for spine. You can use this horseshoe in many different ways too. So for craniotomy, for it says, uh, donut, burr hole, you're going to use this uh, horseshoe headrest. So if we're doing a big subdural, we're taking off half of the skull, so there is nowhere to pin. So we just need to lay the back of the head on this horseshoe. So what I have pictured is our patient laying face down on the horseshoe. That is common, but what's more common is the other way around. So head laying straight back onto that horseshoe. I wanted to add that we can use this Mayfield horseshoe on many other specialties. I've seen it used on ENT surgery, on big neck dissections, and other procedures. So just keep in mind, it's not neuros alone, even though that is what it was made for. So this is your Mayfield horseshoe, still the same Mayfield frame and everything. We're trading out this horseshoe, sorry, this horseshoe part right here for the pins. So no pins into the skull, no fixation. So it's another way to put it is, I want the Mayfield with fixation or without fixation. So with pens in the skull or without pens in the skull. 
I posted two videos because these things are hard to learn how to put together. Uh, it's second nature to me now, of course, but I wanted you to have that availability. So watch both of those videos so you can see how to put these things together. I will also say it was my job for a very long time to clean these Mayfields. So that means after a bloody procedure, these things are coated in coagulated blood. So we had to, at the end of the day, collect the Mayfields, go wash them ourselves. And even though they don't need to be sterilized, we sterilize them because we don't know what types of type of bloodborne pathogens that these patients had. And then we're gonna use it with another patient we didn't want to do that. So we had a big enough sterilizer so we could actually sterilize these Mayfields. They were never used in a sterile fashion, of course, but it just verified that they were actually clean for our patients. So that was your equipment. There's a lot more in your book. You do need to read it all. I'm just pointing out some of the big things for you. Okay, routine supplies. So it says basic pack. You're typically going to have a neuro pack. Some facilities have crany pack and spine packs. Some are even more precise. So make sure you're reading the names of your packs. Um, after that, I will just go through this picture that I've labeled here. So this is an ACDF setup, by the way. That's got a lot of crany instruments and it's got a lot of neuro spine instruments. So it was perfect. So you've got lots of different cottonoids here. If you see this little tray. You'll see it in my other picture. I liked to lay my cottonoids out on that. It was all very nice and neat and you could see them all. Some people just like uh, ease of use, ease of setup and organization. So they put all the strings in the towel to hide it so you could just see the sponges on the end. So cottonoid patties, uh, this is one of the supplies I was talking about that can be used for brain retraction. So one of the surgeons I worked with that did not use brain retractors used lots of these cottonoid patties and you would stack them on top of each other and it would slowly but surely retract that brain tissue back and it's got that long string attached to it and you can pull on that string gently too so a soft cottonoid patty um, is another thing that can be used to pad the brain with retractors or without retractors as i'm telling you uh, you'll definitely always have a local anesthetic on these not always for pain it's because we want local anesthetic with epi your brain, your brain, your scalp bleeds so much that we need to help uh, lessen the bleeding during the case so we can lessen our blood loss because some tumors are extremely vascular and you're gonna have enough blood loss during the case. We don't need to have that blood loss just opening, just getting into the scalp. So we'll uh, start with some local anesthetic to ease the bleeding and then you'll have lots of hemostatic agents available. So any narrow case I did, we always do slow seal, which is not pictured here, but that's, you know, mixed with thrombin. So one that's very copy, popular in narrow is gel foam with thrombin. So that's what you see right here. So they got their gel foam in this package. They pressed it down and then they got some suture scissors and cut it into little bitty squares, probably a quarter of the size of those cottonoids. So they cut it up into all of those squares, and then they have these bayonet forceps ready to hand over to the surgeon. So when they have some bleeding that they want to help stop and not use bipolar or bovi, they're going to use that gel foam with thrombin to help with that. Uh, you'll also see that there is some bacitracin here, 50,000 units. So some surgeons like to sprinkle bacitracin on powder onto the wound before they close to just help ward off infections. Uh, they have the rest of their 1% lidocaine with epi back here. Uh, I have a spinal needle. When I get into spine, I'll explain the purpose for that, but you'll need a spinal needle sometimes on these cases. Um, it's not a needle used for injection. It's used to help mark the spot. And then bone wax. I've already talked a lot about this. Bone wax on these cases, I would not leave it in a square like this. I would separate it and have it in little balls ready to go. So I can put it on the back of a pen field and hand it over. I would even have surgeons that would just put their hand out like this sometimes and I'd put the bone wax ball in their finger so they could insert it. So lots of different ways on that. I think that's most of the supplies I see on here actually. So let's look at your book. Routine supplies, 1,134. So lots of cottonoids, bovi and bipolar, cotton balls, where it says cotton balls. Most of the cotton balls I see in the OR have a radiopaque string attached to it, but the cotton ball has nothing on it, nothing radiopaque. 
So we never use these in surgery. We would sometimes use a cotton ball in the ear um, if we were doing maybe a temporal tumor or somehow cutting into this temporal bone then we'd want to protect that ear from the prep because we don't want to get an alcohol based or any other kind of base prep inside of our ear so we put a cotton ball in there to protect that um, ultrasound you always want to have ultrasound available in the room for these i kind of compare it to vascular there's lots of vascular structures so they may want a handheld ultrasound in there so that they can see what's going on with the patient and the medications I talked about. So those are some of your supplies. The rest I will hit in the surgical procedures. Okay, so that brings me to the surgeries. Well, you know, cranies are my favorite. Uh, so I put a little anatomy review on here for you. So as you're reading, make sure you go through all of these practical considerations. And before I get this anatomy, I can't help it, I'm gonna read some of them. Always test your drills and saws before the procedures. You already know that from orthopedics. Cut surgicel gel foam into same size of cottonoid. Gel foam is soaked in thrombin. I have to say something a little different there. I always cut three different sizes, small, medium, large of everything, of new net, of gel foam and thrombin. This is because every, case is different. So even though they do every surgery the same way, every tumor is a different size, right? So I would cut all different sizes to be prepared for anything because it makes a big difference. Um, I noticed with time, especially Nunit, that's a hemostatic agent that looks like a sheet of cloth, right? And you just lay it on the bleeder and it stops. Under the microscope, too big could block their view. So there were times where I would, the surgeon would say, give me a medium Nunit. And give them a medium new net on a bayonet. They go to insert it. No, 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 that's way too big. So he was thinking medium, but he actually needed a small or an extra small. So you got to think looking through the microscope. You have to think the same way the surgeon is. Uh, after that, 10 mil syringe with saline um, should be available to flush the Fraser suction as it becomes clogged with debris. That is one way to do it. I gave you my ways for a reason. So hypothetical, you're sitting there with a syringe on the end of that Fraser tip, where do you squirt that? <laughs> where do you unclog that suction out? Because there's gonna be a big blood clot that comes out of that suction tip, right? You just find a spot on your back table and make a mess, you can do that. Or you can use one of the different ways that I gave you. Use your stylet, give your suction a drink, take the suction tip off, flip it around, use the suction tubing to um, get rid of that clog. So many different options than what's in your book. So make, make sure you're thinking outside of the box. Um, after that, last one, very important. Never use bacitration irrigation on brain tissue, may cause seizures. So when I get into craniotomies, I'll talk about that a little bit more, but we never put our bacitration into our irrigation until the dura was closed. So some of these surgeons still want bacitration. That's your job to not add it until the dura is closed so that no bacitracin gets onto the brain. Uh, they still might want that bacitracin to irrigate out the other tissues. So that's just the first layer they're closing, right? We did what we wanted to to the brain, now we're gonna close the dura, then we have to close the muscle, sub -Q, and skin. You got all those different layers. So after the dura is closed, you can use bacitracin irrigation, and most surgeons do, but you cannot use it on the brain tissue. Okay, craniotomy anatomy. So you can see all the different bones here. They line up with the lobes, so I will not review that. You can review yourself. I know I taught you the neuroanatomy pretty well. Uh, I put this other picture with it, so you can see where that cella tercia is, so we can see where that pituitary gland is going to be at the end of this. So that is on page 1135. It goes through all the bones, and then it goes through the dura matter. So yes, you need to know all three layers of the meninges. You should know them very well. This should all be review for you. In fact, this exact picture was used. I'll thank Tasha for that one. Very cool picture so you can see the meninges. But I want you to know what you're gonna see in surgery. So in surgery, it's just gonna be the dura matter. You can't really see the pia matter. You can't really, really see the arachnoid matter, but you can see the dura matter. So even though we're technically cutting through all of that and pinning it back to get to the brain, they're just gonna to refer to it as the dura. 
In fact, they're gonna say dura stitch. So we have drilled into the bone to get in. We took the bone flap off. Next thing we see is the dura. They'll cut that open and then tack it back with sutures. So I will read what I wrote for you. The dura matter is tacked back with 4 nylon suture and tagged with a mosquito clamp. Uh, this is an extremely small suture and it's a pop-off. So this is a big danger for dropping. This is one of the many needles that I did find with a rolling magnet. So a lot of ORs have a big rolling magnet. So if you do drop a needle, somebody can roll underneath that surgical field with a magnet and find the needle on it. Uh, if I can find the picture of me finding that little baby 40 TF needle, I will definitely share that with you. Okay, so again, you need to have 40 nylon and you need to be ready with tags to tag these dura stitches out of the way. Okay, after that, it talks about the different folds in your brain. So you should definitely know this, but I loved the picture, so I added it. Um, if it helps you, the sulci sink. So it sinks down every time for the sulci and giant wave for the gyri. So that's how I would always remember the folds of the brain. But this is why we can hold so much information. We have such a big surface area. Our heads look small, but it's full of all this information because of these folds of the brain. So if it weren't for these folds, it would be flat and we would not be the same human beings that we are right now. So know your gyri and your sulci and all your different lobes in the brain. So hopefully I don't have to go over the cerebral hemispheres for you, but in case you forgot what they're separated by, I included this, again, thank you, Tasha, awesome picture of the corpus callosum. Uh, and yes, I've done tumors that are directly on the corpus callosum. So for you, for your studying, you need to make sure you know that this is white matter that's connecting the cerebral hemisphere. So your right and your left side is connected by this corpus callosum. And after that, your book doesn't go into huge detail of all the different lobes. Look at page 1137. You'll see it hits the lobes and basically what they do. I want you to know that part. I will talk a little bit about awake craniotomies, but I had to know every section of that. So if my surgeon was stimulating in the frontal lobe, um, I would know that if something went wrong with their speech, if they were mid-sentence, that's normal. I don't have to worry about my patient. We're in the frontal lobe. We're messing with their speech. So if they're starting to lose their speech, my surgeon knows that and is aware of that. And we're going to not take that part of the tumor. We're going to move over a little bit and find a safe spot. So you really need to know what's in your book. I added this for a review for extra. So you should definitely know all of your lobes. You should know all of your pieces of the brainstem. So make sure you're studying this anatomy and understanding it well. Okay, I will flip over. On page 1138, it goes through all your anatomy of the brainstem, like I told you to look at, and the circle of Willis. So, circle of Willis is amazing. Never seen the thing all together, of course. You see little pieces at a time. Uh, so I, the reason I saw so much of this is aneurysm clippings. So the PCOM, for instance, I did so many aneurysm clippings that he said, we're clipping the PCOM. If you're looking at this, it's posterior communicating artery. Do you need to memorize these? Not necessarily. Do you need to know what the circle of Willis is and the main branches? So everything on this picture should be good for your studying. Note how it comes down to your carotid arteries. Because of this, on aneurysm clippings, sometimes, depending on the surgeon, they can prep out the neck and be ready if they had to, if there's uncontrollable bleeding going on in the brain, if they really had to, we could cut open the neck and clamp that carotid artery, save the patient's life from bleeding out. So that means that something like this in the brain bleeding that badly could kill a patient. So that's why we're in there to clip the aneurysm. So it's not going to rupture on its own and inevitably kill that patient. We're gonna clip it now so that that doesn't happen. Okay, so make sure you know you got brainstem anatomy and the circle of Willis. I put the danger zone for a reason. Anytime you're working on a tumor in this area or clipping an aneurysm, you're in the danger zone. So hopefully you remember everything that the brainstem does for your body, but 
certain areas, you could be lights out when you hit that. Other areas, it could paralyze you. It could take your, uh, well, it could kill you because it's gonna take your respiratory um, functions away. So brainstem is so linked with staying alive that these tumors are very scary. So it's really up to the surgeon. The surgeons have to decide whether something is operable or non-operable. So two different surgeons are gonna give you two different answers. Uh, one of the surgeons I worked with constantly, he got his surgeries, his patients from the surgeons who would turn them down. So a surgeon would say, that's non-operable, I can't help you. And then they would go to him and he would say, that's incorrect, this is operable. It's a huge risk, let's go over all the risks so you make the right decision. But can this be operated on? Yes. So I've said this before, but always get a second opinion. Okay, after you study this circle of willis, I'll read that one part to you. So ring of arteries that gives rise to various branches supplying blood to the brain at the base. I also want you to think of this as a network. So yes, it is a ring of arteries, but it's a network of arteries all working together to provide blood flow to the brain. Okay, I will move on after that actually. You can study that anatomy in both of the danger zones. Head traumas, okay. I hate to say these are my favorite, but they are my favorite probably overall. Um, neurosurgeries tend to be really long. So even though I eventually fell in love with neurosurgery, there were a lot of days where I thought, man, these are long cases. <laughs> I wish I was doing something else. So when a subdural came up, I was so excited because I get to do a craniotomy, but we also are gonna do this really quickly and get in and get out really fast. So I loved these cases. And it is also just truly saving a life too. We're rushing to the OR because your head is bleeding and we gotta get that bone flap off ASAP. Your head, the pressure is increasing constantly. The intracranial pressure is increasing. Your head's filling up with blood. We have to get that skull off ASAP. So as soon as we get the skull off and that big hematoma falls out and that pressure is alleviated, we've succeeded. We're done, really. So we're gonna wash and make sure all the bleeding is gone and then we're gonna close up. So I loved these cases, but there's lots of different options with it. So on this page, 1139, look at your skull traumas. It says head injuries. These are skull traumas. That's what I'd like you to put there. So I have in the picture so you can see the difference between epidural and subdural hematomas and of course, intracerebral hematomas. So that's actually breeding, bleeding inside of the brain. Typically, as far as them communicating with the scrub, they might put down subdural hematoma and then when you start the case, you'll realize it's an epidural hematoma. So there might've been some bleeding and it's right outside of the dura, much safer you're still gonna need the same things for the case. So it really doesn't matter where the bleeding is at. You need everything you need to do to do a craniotomy as quickly as possible. So this is a good example of, if you can find an electric drill, we're gonna use that hand crank drill or whatever we have to do to get the skull off ASAP. So make sure you're reading about all the details through all the different kinds of hematomas. But it focuses on how these usually go hand in hand with fractures. So these are typically patients that are maybe elderly. They slipped and fell and hit their head. Now anybody can slip and fall and hit their head. I'm just saying typically what you're going to see more of are older women that are going to slip and fall on that ice and hit their head. Unfortunately, in the winter, we see so many elderly patients for these one of two things. They either fall and hit their head or they fall and they break their hip both terrible things that can happen and need surgical intervention. I'm gonna read one small passage out of your book for this part. The pressure of blood from the arterial bleeding strips the dura away from the skull, causing more bleeding as tiny veins from the dura and the skull are torn. So that's for epidural hematomas, but it's for all of them. So as I said, that bone is stuck to the dura sometimes. So even just this process of getting the bone out can 
rip it more, cause more bleeding to occur. So this is a case where they're going to check extremely carefully to make sure the bleeding has truly stopped before putting that skull back on and closing up. Let me read another passage about subdural hematomas. When veins bridging to the cerebral cortex to the venous sinus are torn, or the cortex is lacerated, hemorrhage occurs. So you know you have a giant sinus, let me go back. Right here, your superior sagittal sinus over your head. So if you lacerate that, there's gonna be lots of bleeding occurring. So it's giving you more details about these subdural hematomas, but the idea is there's lots of bleeding going on. Even when you think you've got it all, you don't yet. So this is where you'll hear the term drying up. So typically we stop all the bleeding with a bovi or bipolar and irrigate and close, right? After they irrigate, they're just gonna look and stare at all that tissue. Make sure you don't see any bleeding. They might get some hemostatic agents and put those on there just in case. We wanna make sure there's no bleeding before we finish up this case. Okay, that's subdural hematomas. I wanna add one thing, not in your book, that you should definitely write down. Sometimes the surgeons like to keep these subdural hematomas as specimen. So I always kept it on the back table as specimen. Now, it can just fall off. It's such a big blood clot. You know, you have that brain bag attached to your drape. Sometimes it's just gonna fall right off the brain into the brain bag and you'll have to scoop the blood clot out of the brain bag into a specimen cup. So you'll get very messy and hands-on on these cases, but that's why I love them. Uh, the brain bag brings me to the next thing. Hopefully you all see these rainy clips. They are clamped on the scalp because the scalp bleeds so much. That's our best way to help stop the bleeding a little bit so we can do the surgery. These rainy clips are not radiopaque. I will say that one more time. This is a countable item, a rainy clip, that is not radiopaque. <laughs> it is not gonna show up on x-ray. So it's one of those weird things that they don't have a good version that's radiopaque. So they have some metal rainy clips. We actually at our facility tried them before. They stink, they don't work very well. <laughs> they don't clamp onto the skull. So that's why we use these non-radiopaque ones, but that means they can't be seen on x-ray. That means you need to be extra vigilant with the count. So there has been a time where we did an x-ray looking for this rainy clip and it was in that brain bag underneath a bunch of blood, suture strings, all this nasty stuff. That's why we couldn't see it. So my suggestion to you is the first place you look is the easiest place for it to fall. So it's attached to the skull. It could fall straight down into that brain bag. So I had people searching on the floor, all these different places when it was right there in the brain bag. So rainy clips, keep an eye on them and look in that brain bag if you can't find one. Okay, that brings me to cranial nerves. This is stuff you should 100% already have memorized. If you forgot it, here's your review. Um, there's a visual for you so you can see where all of these cranial nerves originate, but you should know that you need to know the name, the Roman numeral, and the function. Now, Roman numerals, you should already know that. We've talked about that with carpal bones too. So this should all be review. So if you are one of those students who's on top of things, both of these slides are review, you don't need to do anything. If you do not remember this stuff, this review is on here for you, for you to memorize. These 100% can be CST questions. So know the name, the Roman numeral, and its function. I'm not gonna go through that part. You should know your cranial nerves. Okay, that brings me to location of different types of brain tumors. So 1,142. So, so many different types of brain tumors and this picture I have here, the location, this can vary. So like something like the schwannomas being in the brainstem, that's pretty consistent, but some things like meningiomas can be in multiple places. So make sure you pay attention to what's in your book. Um, you do need to be familiar with all of these. I'd like you to focus on gliomas and meningiomas. So let's look at meningiomas. So meningiomas are marked on by a like very obvious enhancement of the CT scan and the MRI. Angiography shows characteristics of a blush. 
these are benign tumors. You need to know that part. They are benign. These tumors reoccur if not completely excised. So I did a lot of meningioma cases. That was always a good day. So if you're taking out a brain tumor, we take the tumor out, send it to pathology. If you hear back on the speakerphone, it's a meningioma. Everybody goes, whoo, meningioma, because we like to hear that it is benign. So meningioma is good news if you are trying to figure out what the diagnosis is of this case. So meningiomas kind of arise from that protective covering over the brain, so your dura. So sometimes they're very superficial, as you can see in this picture. And so that means sometimes you'll cut open that dura and it's just all tumor. You're looking down at just all tumor. So if they position the patient correctly and plan the incision correctly, you could open that dura and see just tumor and nothing else because it's very superficial. So those are very specific. The one directly underneath that, acoustic neuroma. I just wanna point out that these cases with acoustic neuromas, they are going to be done with an ENT surgeon. So you have to have an ear surgeon in there. They're gonna do their part, usually the exposure, and then the neurosurgeon comes in to take the tumor out. So everybody has their specialty for a reason. It is an acoustic neuroma, so they're not just gonna go at an ear tumor. They're gonna have the ear surgeon approach it, and then the neurosurgeon will come resect the tumor. Okay, I'll go back up to gliomas then after that. So the one in your picture right here, I see optic glioma. You should know that should be near your optic nerve. But let's look at gliomas any kind. So 40% of primary brain tumors, so the majority are gonna be malignant. So if we heard this is a glioma, we know this is probably malignant. After that, I just want you to read through all of these cases, so especially the incidence. So there's certain ages for a lot of these, and some of them are increased incident with family history. Um, some are just for young patients, some are more for older patients. So make sure you're reading through all the differences so you can understand that. Uh, some have a specific look too, so talking about meningiomas actually had me thinking, they have a specific look. I got to the point where, of course I waited to hear from pathology, but I knew what it was when you were handing it off sometimes. So if it was a meningioma specifically, they're typically kind of runny. It's not like a one big lump. So it would come out in kind of a runny form. It wasn't completely liquid, wasn't completely solid, just kind of looked like this putty almost. And just looking at it, I could tell that looks like a meningioma. And then I would hear back from pathology and say, yep, it's a meningioma. So you can get to the point where you start recognizing these things. Brain tumors are very specific. It's not like other tumors in the body. So there's many times where I've seen tumors where it's not a specific ball. You're not gonna take one big circle out of the brain. It's spread out in different spots on the brain. There's a glioma, for instance. Uh, it says optic glioma on this picture, but there's one called a butterfly glioma. So this spreads across both hemispheres and in the center. That's why they call it a butterfly glioma. It looks like a butterfly. That's one of the cases that a lot of surgeons say, this is inoperable, I can't help you. And that was why I worked with one of the surgeons who would really go through all the risks. So these patients knew very well that they could come out with brain damage with paralysis, something like that. But they wanted that option, so it was worth the risk. So every surgeon is a little bit different, but if you're interested in that, definitely Google butterfly gliomas. They are beautiful looking like a butterfly, but of course terrifying because it takes up so much of your brain to tissue. It's very invasive. So lots of different kind of brain tumors that if I got into all the details, you would learn a lot, but that's not what you need to prepare you for your CST. So I'm gonna focus on that and resist going into too much detail. Okay, finally, craniotomy procedure. So I added this picture so you guys can see that you're not going to always have a one bone approach. So it's not always going to be frontal tumor, occipital tumor. You're gonna see terms like this, suboccipital, uh, frontotemporal, things like that. We can combine the two bones if we're right in between. You're not necessarily gonna be on that suture line, it's just showing that it'll be close so you can prepare. Because a position for a frontal tumor is gonna be different than a frontotemporal. 
Because think about it, we have to put the head in pins, right? That pin can't be in the way of where the surgeon wants to make their incision. So they have to really plan ahead on these. So planning ahead, it talks about that a little bit in your book. The position, it says procedural considerations. That's because every tumor is completely different. So that's why I put position depends on the approach. Um, after that, skin prep, same thing. It goes along with the incision. Every surgeon has a different prep preference. So some people might use that alcohol prep. But you guys know that with craniotomy specifically, maybe we shouldn't use that alcohol prep because we are prepping hair. Now we just shaved the hair, but we didn't shave it to the skin. We don't use razors like that in the OR. We use clippers. So there's that little, little bit of hair still on there and you want to make sure that prep dries completely. So you might see more surgeons doing a chlorhexidine scrub, 10 minute scrub, betadine, things like that, but you can use alcohol-based scrub on there. Just remember, you gotta let it dry. So there's your craniotomy, and you can see what it's gonna look like after they get the bone flap removed and the muscle pulled back. Oh, I love this picture. So craniotomy. This is a really beautiful Mayo setup, first of all. But I want to keep going down the line with this. So let me start at the beginning. So let's say it's a frontal row <laughs> temporal craniotomy. Let's go with that so we're all on the same page because this a procedure just says craniotomy. It doesn't say awake, doesn't say asleep, doesn't say any details. So I'm giving you the detail. So frontal temporal tumor. So as I said, after you make your incision, the first thing they're going to do, stop the bleeding of course, but they are going to attach these rainy clips. So you can see right back here, the scrub tech has the rainy clips loaded, ready to go, and then a cup full of them. This is typically how you're going to apply rainy clips. So you have to pass them over and load another one as they're applying. They're gonna throw it on your mayo stand, you load another one. This is a constant, your hands are moving very quickly thing. There's another option, it's called a rainy clip gun. So this gun contains all of the rainy clips, it's usually 30, and it shoots off like a pistol gun, and they can just put it on the scalp and go like this. I have seen this one malfunction and I never used it again. So we got a brand new rainy clip gun out. I loaded the rainy clips, I handed it over. The surgeon hit the gun motion and it shot all 30 rainy clips throughout the room. My circulator had to crawl on the ground and find all 30 rainy clips because otherwise there'd be an incorrect count. So she had to find every single rainy clip during the procedure while doing her job. So I'm not a fan of the rainy clip guns personally. I will say if you get a rainy clip gun, you need to say, show me how to use this the first time before using it. Uh, but these are just so much easier and I'm more old school. I like hand loading them and I like moving fast. So I don't want the surgeon over there attaching each rainy clip. I wanna be in control of the rainy clips. <laughs> you know, I'm a little bit of a control freak. I would know exactly how many rainy clips I have and handing them over there, and I can only hand one at a time. That way I can keep track. If they have that rainy clip gun, I can't keep track as well. So just know that that is an availability. So after we get in, we've attached these rainy clips. You see them bobying some of this tissue and fascia out of the way. After that, they will start drilling. So you know they're going to drill one burr hole, uh, with either that perforator or that round drill bit. Then they're gonna drill another one, just like in your picture on 1,144. Then they're going to connect the dots. So that's when you're going to put this side cutter attachment on, and they're gonna put in one burr hole, drill all the way around. You're gonna irrigate constantly until it's out. So then you have a thrown flap out. The surgeons are doing their job, right? It's your job to take care of the bone flap. They may not say a thing to you. They take the bone flap off, set it on the mayo. That is your job to secure that bone flap immediately. I will tell you what I did. Uh, most facilities have their own procedure on this, so you can ask, but this is what I always did. I had a special little basin for the bone flap. So I would grab the bone flap. I had two wet Ratex already in there for me to wrap around the bone flap. So this kept it moist throughout the case so I know it would not dry out because as you know, you can't leave tissue on your 
back table, even bone, to dry out. It needs to stay moist the whole time. So you're gonna cover that in wet Ratex and leave it in a nice safe place on your back table. Not setting on the edge of your back table to where it can fall onto the floor, which absolutely happens. You wanna keep it in something, in your basket, in a basin, in something. And I always wrapped two moist Ratex around it. So I knew it was gonna stay safe throughout the case. Um, it takes lots of time to get familiar with the plating system, but as I said, eventually I was plating the bone before handing it over. So you definitely don't want to do that without asking. That's something you need to get trained on, but something you can do to help is scrape off some of that periosteum off of the bone so it's easier for them to get the screws in. So something small like that could show initiative, and then maybe they'd take the time to teach you how to plate the bone flap to get that on. Okay, so this mayo stand, you might think it looks a little messy. It's not, it's just a little disheveled. You can see they have their 4OTF needles ready to tack back that dura after drilling. But as I said, we drilled around, we took the bone flap off. It's safely on the back table in a basin, being kept moist with two Ratex. So you see some rulers over here, right? If you were to ever drop that bone flap, there are ways to handle that. So the reason sometimes they measure it is if they need to fill that in with something or to fill in the defect with an implant. So there's lots of different options on these cases. Okay, so bone flaps off, it's on your back table. Um, now we can cut into the dura. So you can see the instruments on your Mayo stand that you're gonna need. So this bone flap is gone. We are looking at the dura now. So typically they get a 15 blade or an 11 blade and they cut through the dura. After that, you're gonna pass over some Metzenbaum scissors so they can cut that dura all the way across. Immediately as they hand those Metzenbaum scissors back to you, you should pop a 40 nylon into their hand. So they are going to tack that dura back with the 40 nylon. They, it's really surgeon preference on the pickups that they use. One of the surgeons I worked with used Gerald's. Another one used these right here. Now I know you can barely see them and they're not on your book, but they had these triangle tips. So these pickups had these triangle tips and the surgeons I worked with just referred to them as dural pickups. So they only used them for the dura. They were shaped like a little triangle on the end and allowed them to pick it up very nicely. So again, you could use Gerald pickups with that. So you can make that note, but Gerald or dural pickups specifically for this. So very delicate tissue. Okay, after that, they tack the dura back and then we can start working on the brain. So at that point, everything is exposed. So that's when you should be ready to tell your nurse to bring the microscope over. The microscope should already be balanced and draped and prepared. All the nurse has to do is drive it forward for the surgeon to use. Okay. I think that lets me go to the next one. I'm gonna have to flip back and forth. So this is just another craniotomy setup, but more involved. So the only thing extra is this navigation tray. So this setup was done with navigation. So again, they're looking at a live image of their CT scan, usually not MRI, but there's options. Uh, the one I used was Medtronic. There's one called Brain Lab too. There's lots of different options, but the idea is they're looking at a live image so they could hold a probe up to that tumor and they can decide their trajectory. They need to know whether to approach it more laterally or more medially. They need to know the best way to get to that tumor without causing the least amount of damage. That's what navigation does. So a lot of craniotomies are done with navigation now. And I loved that because it was so precise and we could do what was called a keyhole uh, craniotomy. So it's very minimally invasive, about the smallest bone flap possible to give the quickest recovery possible for these patients. So anyways, this is my setup, um, but we're still same procedure. So we've gotten the bone flap off, we've gotten to this point, and now we can take the tumor out. So now they're going to bring the microscope over and we're gonna do the tumor resection. This will all be done with these microscopic instruments. So everybody's different, this is how I set up. I put everything to get into the skull right here. Everything I need is up there ready to go, including all my cords. As soon as we tacked that dura back, as soon as I got those needles back, the needles went 
to my neutral zone and then I grabbed this stuff right here. So this is all my micro surgical instruments. Look, I've got some bayonets, micro scissors, and then two or three little rodents. And these are these little sticks. They're like smaller versions of pen field dissectors. So they can use it during the microscopic portion. That's really it. So I use probably three or four instruments during the craniotomy, like the actual taking the tumor out part. So yes, I have lots of different trays, but very few instruments overall. So after you learn it, it's really not complicated. They might be doing brain surgery, which is complicated, but the tools you have are really not. They're pretty simple. That's why I liked it. Uh, okay, so I went through this procedure. As you can tell, it wasn't exactly the same as your book, so I want you to go through the procedure, but uh, you're going through the same the same steps every time. So there might be one extra step here or there, but it's the same process every time, getting the bone flap off and everything. So I will look at, let's look, 1,144. Let's look at your burr hole. So you can see the pictures of the different burr holes where they were made and how it was uh, encompassed all the way around in a circle. But this can always be different. So I just wanted to point that out. So you can see on this setup, this is like for a keyhole surgery. So I have two packets of suture, one for the dura and one for the vicral for the skin. So we're gonna close that galea, the muscle, and then the subcalea and the skin. That's, that's all I had over here. Some procedures are gonna be more like what's in your book, more invasive. So you're gonna need three, four times that amount of suture. So pay attention to how big your bone flap is and that will tell you how much suture you're gonna need to close that incision. Okay, so now I'm looking at page 1,145. As I told you, my surgeon didn't use retractors. So the next step that I skipped over was putting in retractors before uh, actually taking the tumor out. So the ones that did use the retractors, I will say they would go ahead and bring the microscope up so they can really look at that brain tissue and decide where they wanna put that brain retractor. So they still want the microscope first, but the next step, if they use a retractor, would be that Layla or Greenberg retractor. And as I keep reading, uh, I think I hit everything else, so I will go to the closing. So you guys already saw this plating system, and I talked to you about plating that bone flap. So the only thing I would say is if you do plate that bone flap yourself, make sure you are writing down your plate and screw numbers and exactly how many you used. Okay, well, let's look at this table for a second before I stop with craniotomy. This fluid warmer right here, this actually had cold saline in it. So every craniotomy is different. I told you that we can do craniotomies awake, right? So when our patient is awake, we need to be ready to stop a seizure. So even though you can't see it, it's on the other end of my table, I had some warm saline on the other end of the table. This one is actually ice cold saline. So we opened some sterile ice and added it to our saline and made sure it was ice cold. So if our patient was awake and we were in the middle of surgery and they started seizing and shaking, having a seizure, we'd put ice cold saline with an aseptic irrigation onto the brain and their seizures would stop almost instantaneously. It was really cool thing to see, but uh, something that you need to know. So anytime your patient is awake during brain surgery, you need to have ice cold saline available. It's very common with these patients that have brain tumors to have seizures, especially when we're sitting there poking at, we're literally poking the bear. So we're almost causing a seizure sometimes. So you have to have cold saline available. I think, trying to think of the things that your book kind of left out a little bit. Other than that, it's hemostatic agents. You gotta have lots of bone wax, cottonoids, thrombin, flow seal, just every hemostatic agent you can think of. These tumors are really vascular and just bleed a lot. Um, if you're choosing to do an awake craniotomy, they're gonna do what's called brain mapping, which uh, if I have extra time, it's not in your book, so I didn't want to distract you with it, but if I have extra time, I will talk about brain mapping and awake craniotomies on another day. But 
you just need to focus on what is in your book instead and I could distract you with all of those details. Uh, what you do need to add and do need to know is that cold saline will help stop a seizure on an awake patient. Okay. Let me look at my next one here. Uh, you can watch both of those videos so you can see the difference between an awake craniotomy and when the patient is asleep. Very, very different. Okay, that brings me to craniotomy for aneurysm. I do like aneurysm clippings too. Uh, I prefer to do a craniotomy for tumor versus an aneurysm clipping because they are so involved. Uh, I will say once I finally had that first one rupture, I wasn't scared of them anymore. That was my biggest fear. Signing up for the neuro team was scrubbing aneurysms and I was worried what's gonna happen first time I see one rupture. Well, the only thing you can do is hand them the suction, unfortunately. So sometimes they go to attach this clip right here and it ruptures. The only thing you can do is help the surgeon see. So you hand them a suction, you have an emergency suction available, you open that and hand them that too. Make sure that they can see, hand them anything to stop the bleeding. And then we're just gonna go right back to trying to clip the thing, even though it ruptured. We'll just clip underneath it to stop that bleeding. So very cool case. Same process as a craniotomy I just went through. So I'm not gonna go through the whole process again. What I will tell you is, depending on where it is, a lot of times if it's deep in the brain or they just want a big wide opening to work with, you're going to do what's called a hemicrani. So that means half of the cranium is gonna be taken off. So your bone flap is gonna be this big. On many aneurysms I did, the brain would swell so much that you would see what's called dragging, which is not good for your patient, but very interesting to see. Typically we take the bone flap off and the brain stays up just like it should. It stays exactly how it is. It looks exactly the same with the bone flap on, with it off. When you have all of this trauma happening inside the brain, it can do what's called sagging. So you're working on the case and the brain looks normal. Like I said, it's up high. And then all of a sudden you see it sagging. And it'll almost sag over the bone. So we just, you know, drilled a piece of bone off. Sometimes that brain tissue will sag over the bone. That could damage brain tissue, right? So typically that goes hand in hand with swelling. Their brain is swelled so much that we're not gonna be able to put that bone flap back on. So this is a time where you get to put the bone flap in the freezer with some of these patients. I'll talk about that with cranioplasty too, but if your brain is swollen so much, you don't get to put that bone flap back on. You, the scrub tech, get to wrap it up in a sterile package and put it in the freezer. So then another day when your patient is doing better, their brain isn't swollen anymore, we can come back for what's called a cranioplasty. And you do need to know that. So cranioplasty, if you're not fixing a malformation, it's just putting the bone flap back on the patient. So aneurysm, sometimes we leave the bone flap off, but anytime the brain is too swollen and we can't put that bone flap back on, you're going to wrap it up and put it in the freezer. Extensive labeling. Uh, these are, this is one of the times where I would ask for another pair of gloves too. My gloves are bloody from throughout the case. I don't want to label this person's bone flap with all of their information, their medical record, all this stuff with blood all over it. So I'm going to get another pair of gloves, put it on over. It comes with a permanent marker. I fill out all my labels. It's got the surgeon's name, the date, the hospital, every detail for that patient. And then it goes into that bone freezer. So cool thing, uh, unless you're having to clean out the bone freezer at the end of the year, it's cool that we can keep these bone flaps in the freezer for these patients. But the case is going to be the same process. So I'm just going to look in your book. So craniotomy for aneurysm, 1,147. Cerebral aneurysms are typically found at points of bifurcation. You need to know that part. So where it bifurcates in the arteries of the circle of willis. And we know that all of our aneurysms are gonna be near that circle of willis and it gives you the exact percentage. More than 85% of aneurysms occur in the carotid circulation. So this is why I was telling you, you have to be prepared to make an incision in the neck. We always had that set open and ready to go. So all I'd have to do is hand them a knife. I had everything else I needed. 
So again, 30% of these are arising from that internal carotid artery. So must have access to the neck during aneurysm clipping. That's what you need to know. You will find this under instruments, equipment, and supplies. So carotid set for carotid artery exposure available for hemorrhage control. So this is if the, the bleeding in the brain is so bad that we have to go clamp off the carotid artery. So you don't want to be in that situation, but you got to be ready for it. Okay, so you can see where they're actually attaching the clip here. Again, this is where you have to have finesse if you want to be in neurosurgery script tech. So even if they're rushing and rushing you, you have to be able to move smoothly to load this clip that's very delicate and take some finesse. So watch your aneurysm clipping video right there. That was that surgeon's last one. And then this one shows a little more detail. So typically we go for a temporary and then a permanent. So basically temporary is trial. So let's clip it here a little more laterally away from the defect and see if it gives me the result that I want. So they leave that temporary there, see if it's getting the result they want, seeing is this where I want the permanent clip to be? Do I have it on the right thing? And is this actually where I want it to be? Is it gonna stay? So they try out that temporary clip. If they like it, then they'll add the permanent one. The temporary comes off, only the permanent clip stays in the patient's body. That temporary clip is done. So what my surgeon always said to me is, once it's spring, it's sprung. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but I understood what he meant. Once you squeezed on that clip, I don't want it anymore. He wants a brand new clip that has only been loaded onto that applier once. Because the idea is when you, light it, when you load it, you're pulling the edges. So to that surgeon, it's not the same quality as it was. It's already sprung. He doesn't want it anymore. He wanted a brand new, never stretched out clip, which makes sense, right? We don't want to come back in here for another aneurysm clipping or God forbid something else happened to the patient. So that's why you're going to have a temporary and a permanent clip and you'll have a different applier for that also. So you got to learn to have some finesse on that one. And on that same page, 1,148, I wanna point out one medication that's gonna be different for this one. And I've talked about this drug before, papaverin. So papaverin prevents vasospasm. So especially during an aneurysm, before they even put that temporary clip on, you're gonna hand them a bayonet with gel foam soaked in papaverin. That papaverin, they're just gonna rub over the vessel. So that way when they come at it with instruments, it's not gonna spasm. It's not gonna cause them problems. It's going to be calm and still throughout the case. So that was your aneurysm clippings. They're very cool cases. Um, let's go to cranioplasty like I was talking about. So 1,149. So cranioplasty, as you can see, can be for skull defects. So that's the picture I included. What I want you to know is that this could also be for patients where their brain has swollen, their brain bone flap has been in the freezer, and now we're here to reattach it. So you have just a regular crany tray, and plates and screws, and you went and grabbed your bone flap out of the freezer. I gotta say that is a very rewarding thing too. If you do multiple cases on the same patient and then they're finally back for their cranioplasty to get their bone flap put back on, that is a fantastic day because we don't really hear what happens to our patients a lot as script techs. We see them, we did the surgery, and never hear about them ever again. Um, and I really liked getting to know this patient survived, they're getting their bone flap back on. That's a great day. So cranioplasties can be really cool, but lots of different options. Well, in this case, I just wanna point out one thing. Your equipment, instruments, and supplies. Just one of the options, besides these implants that you see in this picture, is the cement that we use on total joints. So polymethyl methacrylate, hopefully you still know how to pronounce that. That can be used either with implants or just cement alone, I have seen. So maybe there's just a space in between the two bones and they wanna fill in that space with the cement. Um, sometimes they can put what's kind of a piece of mesh underneath it to protect the brain from that cement. There's just lots of different options with cranioplasty. But what I wanted you to add in as a note for sure is that this could be returning the own patient's bone to themselves or repairing a skull defect with a cool implant. So 
uh, the implants are getting even more amazing now too, thanks to 3D printing. So they're getting more precise and more specific for each case. So that's your cranioplasty. Now that brings me to craniostenosis repair. So on this one, I just want you to read through and understand what they're doing here. I added this picture so you know that they could do this endoscopically now. So they make a small incision over the top of the head right here endoscopically, and then they can go in and remove that bone and then start helmet therapy after that. So any of these patients with craniostenosis, just know that they have that option. It could be open like in your book or it could also be endoscopic. So let's look at your book, your surgical anatomy and pathology. So premature closure of the cranial sutures or is your cranial stenosis, as you can see in your pictures. These sutures should remain open until the age of two to allow brain expansion. So that's why your patients are usually gonna be very young on these cases. The most common one is going to be that sagittal suture that you're looking at on that first picture. But other than that, it's gonna be just like a craniotomy. So same prep, same setup. As you can see, rainy clubs, so similar instrumentation also. After craniostenosis, we can go to stereotactic procedures. So you can read everything that's in your book. I want you to look at these pictures. So these are not this one right here, actually. This one is my picture, and both of these are my personal pictures. So that means this was difficult for me to learn how to put this frame together. It was very difficult. So as I was learning this process over a few months, every day I was taking pictures of instrumentations. Now this one, of course, has a patient's head in it, so that is from a surgeon who I said, I need a picture of the motor so I can learn how to put it together and just sent me the picture, uh, which you should not do, HIPAA violations, right? But they take pictures for education, so they get to do that all the time when they're at teaching hospitals. So I have lots of pictures of the frame, and you can watch a YouTube video of how to put this together, but this is one of those detailed procedures. It's not something that you're gonna learn in the book and then go do. This was something I went home and watched YouTube videos every night. I took pictures. Um, I came in an hour early. Every time we scheduled a deep brain stimulator, I came in an hour early. They even said, <laughs> so my shift started at 6.30. Um, they said, you should, you know, probably get here at six because of your deep brain stimulators. And I laughed and I said, no, I'll be here an hour early. And even then I won't have enough time <laughs> to perfect putting this frame together. So if you pick something very specific, it's going to take that effort. You're going to have to do your own research. Nobody's going to train you on it because there was nobody to train me on this. They said, hey, we're doing deep brain stimulators now. You want to do one? <laughs> There was no training on how to do it. So sometimes you have to do your own research and your own personal training for yourself, and you really need to know that. So let's talk about these stereotactic procedures. So first of all, this is what the frame looks like on the patient. The patient's head will be in pins, but it's a little bit different type of pinning. So it's a different type of pinning to accommodate this frame for the stereotactic procedure. So your stereotactic frame is gonna be on page 1,152. So that's what that frame is gonna look like. So they're gonna have four pinholes, same thing. They're gonna use lots of lidocaine with epinephrine um, for these patients. Now these patients are always awake for deep brain stimulators or any stereotactic procedure. So lots of lidocaine, lots of making sure the patient feels comfortable before starting these cases. Okay, so again, you need to read all this. It talks about stereotactic procedures in general. So like craniectomies, different procedures. I wanted to talk about deep brain stimulators because there's not anything more to add than what is in your book. But this is a stereotactic procedure, deep brain stimulator. This is what I did a lot of after I finally perfected it. And it was the most rewarding case. So after the science of putting this frame together, See all the numbers on each side of this? So they would come in with their stereotactic machine, come in with the CTs and the MRIs, the imaging, their plan. They're in the corner, they're planning, and then they start giving me numbers. From these numbers, 
we are setting up the frame so when we attach it to the patient's head, this point is going to be pointing directly where we're gonna drill and insert the brain stimulator. If it's done correctly and planned out correctly, we get the brain stimulator in the right spot, first time, first shot, and that means that patient can have a less traumatic surgery. Instead of it taking hours and hours, if they get it the first time, they don't have to go through so much testing while they're awake during surgery. So this could be really beneficial for your patient. What's funny, you probably can't tell this picture. I took this picture because it's off. This is how precise it is. I don't know if you can see this, but the very tips of these two um, pointers. So they are supposed to be exactly on each other if your frame is set up correctly, if it is calibrated correctly. So because mine is like this, instead of like this, it was off. So I <laughs> did all my numbers, I set it up and it was off. And this was way before the patient was coming in the room. So I scrubbed out, <laughs> took a picture so that maybe when the rep came in to help me figure this out and get it correctly that I would remember my mistake. So I, my thought process was, let me take a picture of my mistake. <laughs> so even though it looks like it's ready to go, it's a millimeter off, which is not good enough. So that means I had to, after this picture and getting the patient in the room, uh, I scrubbed back in and luckily the rep was there and I said, okay, please help me wise this off a little bit. They give me some pointers, we figure it out. And then as soon as I scrub out, I'm making that note. I wrote that down for the next time so that the next time I set it up, it's 100% correct. So you gotta really put in some effort if you want these cases, but I'll tell you why it's so rewarding. So the moment they get this brain stimulator into the brain of the right spot, they have your patient doing different tests and you can see this on the video. They might have them draw a circle on a piece of paper. They might have them open and close their hands, always have them touch their nose and then back out. Things for depth perception, hand motor coordination. So you could see somebody with severe Parkinson's and they go like this and they can't find their nose. They're shaking so bad. Or they're shaking and they're hitting their face. They can't touch their nose. So their shake is this bad. And then you get that deep brain stimulator in the right spot and it just stops. And for the first time ever, that patient is able to go like this and back without hitting themselves in the face. They're able to draw a spiral on a piece of paper for the first time ever without it just looking like a scribble. So sometimes it's emotional for these patients because they've been shaking terribly for years and then all of a sudden it just stops. So what was really rewarding for me was to see that and to hear my surgeon say to the patient, I think we alleviated 99% of your tremor. That's the best I can do. Um, you know, how are you feeling? <laughs> and they usually are, I'm fantastic, thank you. You will have the random patients who are searching for perfection and you don't always get that. So there's a reason why we say 99% typically on these. You're not gonna get the entire tremor to go away with essential tremors or with Parkinson's patients. But if you ever get the chance to see one of these cases, it's just so rewarding. So I hope you jump on one if you get the chance. Okay, that brings me to VP shunts. So these are much more common. You'll definitely see these. So we are shunting the CSF fluid from our ventricles into the belly. So that's the procedure, and you're gonna have two setups. So let's look at your book, so page 1,155. So understand how the CSF flows through your brain and the different ventricles inside your brain. You need to understand that anatomy to understand this portion. So CSF flows through the interventricular canal into that third ventricle. From the third ventricle, it flows through the aqueduct into the fourth ventricle. From there, it enters that subarachnoid space, and you know what that part is. So hopefully that's review anatomy. So after that subarachnoid space, it fills that fourth ventricular wall. The CFF, CSF flows from the fourth ventricle into the spinal cord. So after the spinal cord, of course, it surrounds the brain also. So the brain and the spinal cord. So understand how the ventricles work with CSF and how the CSF flows through your brain and why you need it constantly throughout your life. And also why you can't have too much of it, which is why we're here for the VP shunt. 
So if you have too much, too much pressure being pushed on the ventricles from the CSF, we can shunt that into your peritoneum. So they're going to shunt it to the peritoneal cavity. So you will definitely have to watch the surgery to fully understand how this is gonna happen. But you can see where they're putting in the valve is gonna be a very small incision. And then they actually tunnel from this incision, they tunnel right under the skin with a tunneler, big instrument, all the way down to the belly. The way we did this is we laparoscopically grabbed the end of that catheter with general surgery and attached it to the peritoneum. So we knew that catheter landed in the safe spot because we had general surgery set up doing the laparoscopic portion, and then we had neurosurgery doing the head portion. So the only time they met was when they tunneled. So neuro went first and tunneled that catheter down to the belly. General surgery grabbed that catheter, made sure it's in that peritoneal cavity laparoscopically. Um, then they do some tests to verify and you're done. So then they'll close up the laparoscopic ports and the head at the same time. So some facilities you'll get two scrub techs on this, one for general, one for neuro. Other places you won't and you'll have to double duty as I did. So if you have to do that, I suggest two mayo stands. So I put two setups, but really it's one back table setup and then I gave general surgery a mayo. Here's your mayo. I put a certain amount of counted supplies on there for a reason. The only time I really had to go back over there was to hand them suture. Otherwise it was self-service off the mayo, which is always terrifying because surgeons make a mess, but it had to be done. Then I could stay with neuro, make sure we get this VP shunt in correctly. So you can see they're inserting it right here. You can see the long portion of the tube right here. And then you can see they're gonna attach it in the peritoneum. So this is what the pieces actually look like. These are the extra devices that are gonna be open to you. So there's an actual valve and then there's a catheter on either end. So you, the scrub tech, have to purge the valve and then attach the two catheters, proximal and distal. So you can see in your picture right here, there's the shunt valve, the ventricular catheter goes in the ventricle, and then this distal catheter is what ends up in your peritoneum. So we're taking the CSF from the ventricle through that valve into the peritoneum. So it's getting rid of the issue. We're having too much pressure on the ventricles due to all this extra CSF, so we are shunting it to the abdomen. So you need to pick up this valve, put it in the saline, purge it really well, and then purge all of the lines to make sure there's no air bubbles and anything in it. So kind of like how we learned with vascular surgery to flush these lines with heparinized saline. It's a similar idea. We don't want any air bubbles or anything like that in there, but this isn't vascular, so we don't need to flush it with anything heparinized. We just wanna make sure there's no air in there never want to send air into the body, right? So that is a big job for you to flush those valves. Sorry, so after you have done both of those and they've attached that, uh, you'll have to do a count. I always did mine um, one count together, but if you have two scrub techs, you'll get the joy of she'll have their own count on general and you'll have a count on neurosurgery, so. A uh, complicated setup, but really for your setting, you need to study that anatomy on page 1155, and it uh, melts over into the next page too. So one more time, I want to point out the ventricular catheter is proximal. It's going to be in your head, correct, in the ventricle. This little valve, the shunt valve, will be somewhere behind your ear. And then from there, it gets tunneled and the distal catheter is what's going to be in your peritoneum. So one, two, three pieces all put together. Uh, what is really fun, I think, is after you attach both of these distal and proximal ends of the catheter, you get to tie a silk tie very securely on there. And that's the only thing that's holding the connection between both catheters and that valve. So potentially for the rest of this patient's life, Usually they get out before then, but potentially forever that could be in there. So you should practice tying some knots if you haven't, because even though it's not necessarily a scrub tech duty, you will have to do it in situations like this. So make sure you practice some things like that and study this anatomy for VP shunts. That brings me to ventriculostomy.
So this is another one of my actual pictures. So this is hands-on. You can see the navigation stuff was put back. So we were gonna use navigation and they decided to just go off of the imaging we had. So CT and MRI imaging. I have new knit cut up in all three different sizes and bayonets ready to go. That's my priority. Ventriculostomy is minimally invasive. So we wanna get into that ventricle without cutting into the brain and getting to the ventricle, right? So we are going to do the least invasive incision right in between certain areas. So we're not uh, damaging any brain tissue. We're gonna go directly into that ventricle. So ventriculostomy setup, you're going to have kind of, it's like an endoscopic version of brain surgery. So it doesn't look like much right here, but the small skinny tube is the only working instruments that are gonna go into that ventricle. So that is your ventriculostomy setup. So it's a crany setup, but you're gonna have a camera-like cordoscope and then a very skinny version to go into that ventricle. Sometimes we had a fiber optic camera that would go through something like this, so it was even tinier. So minimally invasive is the name of the game. Okay, after ventriculostomy, let's go over that one. So you see your setup. Let's look at transphenoidal. So it says, um, it says specific, I wanna talk about pituitary tumors in general. So that's why I put pituitary anatomy on here. So yes, transphenoidal, so we're going through the nose transnasally to do this case. So I want you to know your location of the pituitary gland. That's why I put a good anatomy review on there for you. So you know where that cella tertia is and you know exactly where that pituitary gland is located. So this is a cool anatomy picture. You're not gonna get to see it that well. And as we are just gonna put the scope up the nose. So that means you're gonna have the scope up the nose. We're gonna have working instruments through the other nair. So we're working through both nostrils at the same time to get to that pituitary gland. I also added this picture so you can see why we go through the nose. Why would we cut through the skull when the safest way is to go through the nose to get to that pituitary gland? So anytime you see transphenoidal surgery, they are talking about going through the nose. So, and you should know where your sphenoid bone is. So transphenoidal, that's another one you can uh, send me a message of you pronunciating that correctly if you'd like. So know you where your pituitary gland is. It's about the, it says it's about the size of a grape I've seen smaller. Uh, I've also seen way bigger. So when a tumor has overtaken it, it can grow into bigger like pieces of pituitary. So maybe it should be the size of a grape, but it's going to start lumps on it. So it's got big pieces on it. So you know where it is in that cella tercia. You know the pituitary gland is connected to the hypothalamus. So you should know your anatomy. After that, I already told you this is performed endonasally. So know what you need to have, endoscope, camera, light cord. So we're putting the camera up one nose, working instruments through the other. Definitely need anti-fog solution. Remember this is called FRED to prevent fogging. You need lots of hemostatic agents because the nose bleeds worse than the scalp does. So we use constant flow seal, Nunit, thrombin with gel foam, anything you can think of and have lots of extra in the room. Uh, nasal packing from the end of the case. So this is not cotinoids. We learned in ENT how to put cotinoids um, inside the nose before the nasal procedure. This is packing for after, so it's considered a dressing. Um, I've seen people do nasal splints and then what's called Mariseal. So they're sponges that are hemostatic agents similar to what Nunit does. So it's going to stop the bleeding very quickly. But lots of different options for nasal packing, but you will need nasal packing for the end of this case. Now, when they take the tumor out, you gotta look at your anatomy right here for a second. When they take this tumor out, sometimes there's a hole. So there's still a hole into the brain. There shouldn't be a passageway there, right? If there's a hole between your nose into the brain that's just open constantly, that's gonna cause issues. So we have to close up that hole that we've made during the surgery. The way they do this is with a graft. So you can either get some fascia, from somewhere else in the body, we usually did thigh or fat. Uh, patients love doing fat grafts from their belly. If, they, if you tell your patient, hey, could we take a little fat off your belly and put it up your nose? They go, yeah, take some of that fat off of my belly. So 
either the belly for a fat graft or more commonly fascia because that is better to cover that hole. So we would do anterior thigh fascia graft. So you get a minor tray separate setup because it's clean, not up the nose. And you do that graft and then, uh, sorry, you change gloves, do that graft and then take that graft and put it, place it up in the nose. There's a drug we have talked about before called to seal. Um, it could be used as a hemostatic agent, but it's more often used as glue. To seal, we always used at the end of these cases. So anytime there was that graft of fascia or fat, we put the graft up there and then spray to seal on it and kind of glued it into place. So we take that out, irrigate and everything, and then put nasal packing up there. The danger with that, you wanna make sure your to seal has dried completely. So if you put your nasal packing right on top of some glue, when this patient is waking up and recovering, next day we take the nasal packing out, you pull out the to seal and the fascia graft, and then you have to go in and redo the surgery. So make sure you are letting that to seal, the glue, fibrin glue, dry before moving on to the end of this procedure. Uh, if you look at page 1160, you'll see the setup for this procedure is pretty invasive because they're gonna need monitors, they're gonna need lots of different things in the room. And especially if you're taking a graft, you gotta have another sterile setup with a minor tray and everything. So you have a lot of moving parts in this room for these cases. Uh, the biggest struggle for me was trying to make sure the surgeon understood that we're up the nose right now. ENT surgeons are used to this, but neurosurgeons aren't used to working up the nose. So they're in a mindset of, I'm always in a sterile environment. So that's why you, you need to be a good scrub tech and remind them that we're working up the nose. Because many times we are working up the nose and they would say, okay, let's take the fascia graft. And I said, okay, let's change gloves first. That's your job as the scrub tech to remind them. So just keep that in mind. And like I said, there's also acoustic neuromas where you would work hand in hand with the ear surgeon. Same thing, you wanna separate the dirty from the clean. So more like sterile versus non-sterile. So just keep that in mind. Uh, that was my head procedures, I guess I should say, because tomorrow I will go over all the spinal procedures and a couple of nerve procedures. So let me know if you have any questions at all. Um, you know I have lots more information about neurosurgery. I just want you to focus on what you need to know for your test and your CST. So if you have something you're curious about, you want more information, I can definitely tell you some more. So ask any questions if you have it. And I will talk to you guys soon.